recording. And again, like if you can um, say hi to to um, Kelsey. Kelsey, could you start the session? This is yes. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to talk about. Um, what I do here at the Academy and Rainforest in general and what everyone can do to help rain, Rainforest survive. So I'm gonna share my screen and start the slideshow. All right, so I am, hello, I am Kelsey. I'm a biologist at the Steinhardt Aquarium, which is inside the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. And I have always loved animals. I'm sure many of you love animals as well. Sumi was telling me um, that many of you are, are avid animal lovers. Um, and when I was a little girl, I used to go out on my parents, um, my grandparents' property. They had a little pond that had a lot of frogs in it. And so I'd go out with my sister and we'd catch frogs and put them in a bucket and then put them all back. And that was something that I did as a little girl, and I had so much fun doing it. And I knew that I always wanted to work with animals. Um, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian as a kid. And so when I was in high school, I worked at a vet office very briefly and then decided that I liked some of the different kinds of animals, not necessarily the dogs and cats. I love dogs and cats, but I also wanted to work with frogs and birds and other things too. So now I take care of all of the living animals at the Academy of Sciences, um, and I try to advocate for other animals that are all over the world. So Sumi told, you, told me that you all had an activity to draw um, some of your favorite rainforest animals. And so I didn't draw this one, but I took this photo of one of my favorite animals, which is a red-eyed green tree frog. I don't know if any of you have actually seen one of these before, but I just love how many colors they have. And I took this photo uh, a couple months ago. I was down in the rainforest myself, so I got to see one of them, which is really cool. Okay, so rainforests are one of the um, best ecosystems in the entire world to fight climate change just because there are so many plants packed into such a small amount of space. Um, and rainforests only cover about 3% of the whole world's area. So rainforests are not very large, but they do a lot of really important work. They provide air for us. So they convert carbon dioxide into oxygen that we need to breathe. Um, they provide water. So rainforests have the highest rainfall of any other ecosystem. And all that water goes into either the plants or into waterways. They provide shelter. So lots of trees means lots of places for animals and things to live. And also rainforests provide medicine. There's quite a few plants out there that have different components to them that we use to make medicine, whether it's like a painkiller or a anesthetic or, you know, some things like that. So we get a lot of things that we need to live out of the rainforest. They're also home to over half of the world's land animal species. So tiny, tiny amount of space, but lots and lots of different types of animals. Um, but rainforests are really delicate. If you take away some species or you take away some animals or some plants, um, that can cause a really big problem for everything else that lives in there. So we have to be really careful how we interact with rainforests. So some of the big threats that rainforests um, are facing are deforestation, or basically just cutting down the trees to make um, wood for building houses or furniture, or even making paper. All of those things have to come from somewhere, and those tend to come from the forest. Um, a lot of uh, companies will burn trees for electricity, so they have to cut down the trees to, to convert it to electricity. Um, and a lot of times they'll cut down parts of the rainforest to dig for other things like gold or oil is found underground. So to access those, you have to cut down all the trees. And in this um, picture that I put in the corner, this is what we call fragmentation, which is a big fancy word for just creating little tiny pockets of trees. And when you do that, you're basically making all of those animals and things that live in that pocket isolated from everything else. And that can cause a big problem also. 
So fragmentation and deforestation are a really big threat. Mm -hmm. um, cutting down forests to build roads and to expand cities is really bad. And then also agriculture and uh, cattle grazing. So all of those cows that people raise to provide food, those have to go somewhere. So they'll cut down forests so that cattle have a place to graze. Um, or if cities are expanding, they'll cut down forests to plant like corn or other crops that humans eat. Um, so they have a lot of really, really bad threats that cutting down the forest is, um, is not a very good thing. Mm. And I'll just mention to invasive species, that is a word that we use for animals that are not necessarily supposed to be there. It could be either animals or plants. But when you introduce a new animal or plant to an area where they don't normally live, they usually outcompete things that are supposed to be there. And that can also cause some problems. Kelsey? Yes. Take, um, a couple of que questions here. I think sure. Lincoln had a question. Lincoln. Oh, he doesn't have one. Yes, I do. What is it? Well, well, is carbon dioxide a plant? No. That's a very good question. Carbon dioxide is a gas that when we as humans breathe, we breathe in oxygen. So we need oxygen to survive. And that oxygen goes through our blood system, our heart, all of that. And then when we breathe out, we breathe out carbon dioxide, which then goes out into the atmosphere. And trees, trees basically breathe in carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen. So we need trees to live because they give us the oxygen that we need. But if there's too much carbon dioxide out in the atmosphere, then that's when temperatures start rising, things get out of balance, and it causes some big problems. Mm -hmm. That was a great question, Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Very important for you guys to remember this. Yeah, Chen, do you also have a question? Go ahead, Chen. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. There's like only like three rainforests in the whole world now. Yeah, there's there's several big ones that people talk about all the time. There's many, many little rainforests all over the world, but there's only a few that people talk about all the time because they're the really big ones. Very good, Chan. All right, so let's continue. Oh, Jaden has a question. Jaden, you can go ahead and Ask the question. Um, so I have three questions. Okay. The first question is, what do you do to reserve like rainforests? Like try to keep them stay alive. What do you do? Mm. Great question. Um, so there are different organizations that will protect land. So there's like national forests. Um, if you if there's a government that says this is a national forest, there's rules that nobody can go in there and touch it. So you can visit those parks, but you can't cut down any trees or take any animals or anything like that. So you can make a natural a national park. There's also some other organizations that will, they designate some land that people can use for things, but then if that amount of land is being used, then they have to protect a different part of land. So there's a lot of different people that are protecting land, but as a whole, we're still cutting down too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think she's going to also show throughout the presentation, like what kind of things are being done, because it's not just about the land that has to be protected, but what lives there and like, you know, what affects the whole environment around it. All those things need to be protected. And it becomes not just that area, it becomes the entire world. Right, guys? Yes. So she's gonna talk a, a lot more about this through the, throughout the presentation. Yeah, so, so, oh, Kate, what question is it? You guys, if we have so many questions, like at the beginning, we might not <laughs> be able to walk through everything. So save your questions. Yeah, and you guys can the always way, type them and we can come back to them. Yeah, okay. by the way, guys, if you guys would like to draw some stuff that 
you know, she's talking about throughout the session, feel free to do that. Because we gave you guys a challenge, but like there's only a few people that actually took the challenge. But we would love to show what, what you guys, you know, what you guys uh, imagine. Yeah. So feel free to do that. And I think Sua and Kate. So go ahead. If the question is quick. So um, the first thing I didn't know, rainforest only covered three, three for three percent of the world. I mean, considering the like most of the world was water, I it makes sense. But like, I didn't know that. Second, my question is like, why? Is it that like whenever you go to a forest, it has to be that specific area you build, you decide to build something there? Like you just build it somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. There's when when you have rainforest spaces can be very limiting on like where you can build stuff, and especially as the world is growing and the populations are growing with more people it's hard to put people places without expanding into forest that if you think about where cities already are to make them bigger it's hard to make them bigger without going into a forest so we have to figure out ways to expand in different ways all right any more questions I think we can continue. Just mute myself. We can continue. All right, so you go. I just have a quick slide on the impact of what happens when we cut down forest or when rainforests suffer. Um, we lose animals, so animal extinctions, some of them suffer, um, and biodiversity loss. Biodiversity is just a fancy word that means the amount of species. So. Um, we lose the amount of species that we have. Desertification is a fancy word that means the rainforest turns into a desert. So when you take away the trees, um, there isn't as much, there aren't as many things absorbing the water. The water can make the, the soil erode or wash away. Um, we have fewer crops and food sources. So if you think about all of those trees in the rainforest, all of those plants, a lot of them produce fruit. A lot of them are edible. And so if we cut down um, the rainforest, we're getting rid of food sources. Um, flooding, when you get rid of tree roots, tree roots hold the ground together. So when you pull trees out, there's nothing holding the, the ground together anymore. And so when it rains, it washes the soil away, it can cause flooding, all of those things. And there's quite a few people that um, need the rainforest for their livelihood. So a lot of people use the rainforest um, to earn money. And if you get rid of it, um, they struggle. And then of course, we talked about the carbon dioxide. So increased gases in the atmosphere that can cause climate change issues. So. I live in San Francisco and I obviously don't go to the Amazon rainforest every day. Instead, I go to the Academy of Sciences and we have our own Osher rainforest here, which is a 90 foot diameter glass dome. So when you walk inside the building, you'll see this giant glass dome with a rainforest inside of it. And this is a replica of what rainforests are like all over the world. We have over 1,600 different species of plants and animals living in our rainforest. And it's designed with every layer that you would find in the rainforest. So we have a giant tank at the bottom that we call the flooded forest. So when it rains in the rainforest, there's um, streams and rivers that flood and a lot of fish and turtles and things live in there. So we have a flooded forest tank. We, the first floor is the forest floor. The middle floor is the sort of mid layer of the rainforest. And then of course on the top we have the canopy. So as you walk through, you'll see the changes of the rainforest and all the different animals at every level as well. So <clears throat> what is a day inside the rainforest with us, with the biologists? So all of those animals and plants that we have have to eat, 
we have to make sure that they're happy, that their um, habitats are clean, that they have proper lighting and humidity and things like that. So one of my jobs every day when I come in is first thing I will walk through all of the, the exhibits and make sure that all of the animals are healthy. And if they're not, we have a veterinarian here on staff that can help us keep our animals healthy. So we mist, we water the plants, we feed our animals, of course. I'll play this video again because it's fun. Watch out. And then we also have quite a few fish tanks um, that require a lot of maintenance. So sometimes we'll do water changes or add fertilizer, scrub the windows, things like that. So that's just basic animal husbandry, we call it. So anybody who takes care of animals for a living, um, we're, we're doing animal husbandry. There's also three stories of plants in the rainforest that require watering every single day. So um, we usually get to work at about seven in the morning and our rainforest opens at 10 in the morning. So that gives us three hours to water all the plants feed all the animals, um, clean up after ourselves, and make sure that everything is ready to go for, for the public to come through and look at things. And then of course, our animals need extra enrichment. So it's really important to us that we keep their well-being um, as high as possible. And so we have some birds in there. These are the macaws. Um, that are very, very intelligent and they get bored very easily. So we have to give them toys and enrichment and things to keep them mentally stimulated and um, have fun and all of those things. So we come up with toys, we come up with different sounds or smells or things that they can tear apart, food items, things like that, just to keep them um, happy and healthy. And why does it matter? So I come here to work every day and take care of our animals, but how does that impact the rainforest everywhere else in the world? Well, I will tell you. So we have butterflies. This is just one example of how our rainforest helps other places. Um, we have butterflies in our rainforest that we get delivered to us from different suppliers in different countries all around the world. And one of them is in Costa Rica, which is in Central America. Um, one of them is in Ecuador, which is in South America. Occasionally we'll get butterflies shipped to us from Southeast Asia. But basically the way that it works is we send money to these butterfly farmers, which are oftentimes um, independent um, families or um, people that have started their own butterfly farms in their own countries. Um, we give them money so that they send us the butterflies in their little chrysalis form. Um, and they use that money to plant more plants and expand their farms. So they're basically replanting rainforests and inviting animals to come back into those areas. And then we get those butterflies. We can put them in our rainforest. And so people learn about butterflies and also have something really pretty to look at. So it's a really good way for us to be able to support people doing conservation, rainforest conservation, in their own countries. So this video is talking about one of our butterfly suppliers in Costa Rica. So they have all these little chrysalis. These are all different types of butterflies, the different colors. Wow. And they package them in these um, soft little boxes. Mm -hmm. And then they send it to us. And we'll get them hopefully the next day. And then if I fast forward a little bit, these are my coworkers pinning those chrysalis on boards that we put in the rainforest. And then as the butterflies emerge, we'll release them into our rainforest. So wow. it's a really fun thing that we get to do here. And um, we get butterflies in every two weeks. So we're constantly able to support other places. Mm. Can we pause here for a second? Because I absolutely I that Kate has a burning question or comment. We have a question. Go for it. So it's a comment mm -hmm. about the rainforest. And there's like, I know 
that the butterflies are really, really pretty, and I've went there before. Like, there's like a bridge in like the middle part of the dome, and then you can walk across, see the, all the butterflies. Mm -hmm. And my mom was like, and my mom and my brother and my dad were like hyped, and they're like, oh, "Look at those! Look at that!" And I'm like, "It's just a butterfly." <laughs> why are you so excited it's just a butterfly <laughs> and then the second thing is that i know mo like all of the layers of the rainforest and then i'll start from the top to the bottom so the very top i think is the canopy yep and then the second tallest or app before that is the understory mm -hmm. and then before that i think i forgot i forgot that one i always forget the one before the understory but the two ones i always remember is the canopy and the understory yes i forget yes. the other ones the understory can be anywhere from the ground to the canopy so anything that's not directly in sunlight is the understory but we kind of break it up to forest floor, understory, and then canopy. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Was there another question? Sua, what's your question, honey? Go ahead, Sua. You're muted, Sua. So I've been waiting a long time. Mm -hmm. And so I know somebody who made her younger siblings hold their breath for 15 minutes just to save, like, what was it called again? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide every day. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I don't know if that's very good to hold your breath for that long. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, I know... um. I know, like, so me and my little sister, uh -huh. when I was six, I used to, like, we used to, like, raise butterflies. Oh, Very I think cool. a lot of you guys have done that, so that's cool. Yeah, that's really important to do because butterflies are what we call pollinators. So they go to certain plants, and they pick up the pollen, and then they'll take it to other plants, and that's how plants reproduce. So we need butterflies to make sure that plants survive. So if you're raising native butterflies for California, that's really, really good. Very nice. Chan, what's your question, honey? After Chan, we'll come to Alice. Um, my question is, actually, I have a comment. That's fine. Comment. Mm -hmm. First of all, when I was in kindergarten and TK, uh -huh. I used to, I used to, in my school, I used to really send butterflies out and even really seeing how they produce and make their chrysalis and stuff. Wow. And second of all, I've been there in the rainforest. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Maybe in the future, when you go back, you will see Kelsey there. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Alice? What's your question or a comment? Go ahead. When I was little, mm -hmm. I thought when the butterfly's color was black and yellow i thought it was a bee and my mom said why are you afraid it's a butterfly <laughs> that's very funny yeah sometimes you know you see all kinds of colors of butterflies yeah kelsey do you have any favorite butterfly my favorite butterfly is this one that we have over here on the the top left corner. These are called a Cairns bird wing. They're found in Australia. And oh. the, the males are really bright blue and green like this with a yellow body. And the females have a brown body. They're a little bit more brown, but they're bigger than the males. 
And these ones are probably about the size of my hand from, from wing to wing. They're very big. Wow. wow. Mm-hmm. That's super cool. Yeah. So guys, let's, let's move on because there's a bunch more and you're going to be, oh, Lincoln, I see that you drew something. So we're going to have a show time at the end. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So along with doing butterflies, we also have other in-house breeding things. So um, if you see this video, this is a tiny, tiny baby um, leaf insect. And then the mama is a giant leaf insect, we call them. Those ones are found in Southeast Asia. And then we have these large um, bugs called jungle nymphs, and that's what their babies look like. So we do some in-house breeding to keep a lot of species um, thriving. And then we also have different programs that we're part of for some animals that are very rare um, out in the wild. So these yellow rumped caciques, that's what their babies look like. These ones are endangered, which means that there aren't very many left of them in the wild and we need to help them out a little bit. And same thing with these geckos. Um, But there are species survival plans for each of these types of animals which basically is just a captive breeding. um, And we do some other conservation work with those animals. And I'm gonna focus on these ones down here. These are called Panamanian golden frogs. And these ones are actually, um, we think they're extinct in the wild, which means that you can't see them anymore in the wild. But luckily before they went extinct, um, a few people went out and collected some and shipped them to the United States. Um, so that we could breed them and hopefully come up with a plan to reintroduce them into the wild so that they can come back so we don't lose them 100%. And we here at the Academy are one of the places that has some of them. Um, So we're holding them and hopefully going to breed them soon. But these guys are actually a toad. So um, little fun fact, all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. And the way to tell them apart is usually toads um, have kind of thicker, more like bumpy skin. Um, And there's a couple other differences too. But these guys are actually a toad and they are found in Panama, which is a country at the very um, bottom edge of Central America. So it's a little strip of land that connects Central America to South America. Um, And these ones are, we think, no longer in the wild. So very important rainforest species. And the main reason for their extinction is due to pollution. Um, So these ones live in the water. And um, when people use fertilizers or trash or anything like that, microplastics, when that washes into the water, um, it usually kills the frogs, so it's really bad for them. Um, Climate change is another, so these ones are found um, in waterways in sort of um, cooler montane forests, and so with really high temperatures, they don't do really well. Um, Climate change is also changing how rainfall patterns um, happen, and so if they're without water, that can be kind of bad for them. But the main reason these guys are are having trouble is because of this fungus. We call it chytrid fungus. And the full word is Patricochytrium dendrobotitis, which sounds like a Dr. Seuss word. So I'm going to call it chytrid fungus. Um, And chytrid fungus is a disease that travels in the waterways, and it can affect the skin in a lot of frogs. So frogs all over the world are affected by it. And I think something like... 90 species of frogs have gone extinct because of this fungus and researchers are doing a lot of work to figure out where it came from, why it's so bad, how to help frogs be um, a little bit more protected from it. Um, So we here at the Academy are part of this um, Panamanian Golden Frog Species Survival Program. Um, This photo down here shows what they used to look like in Panama. So if you went on a walk 15 years ago, you'd see all these Panamanian golden frogs on the rocks. They were all over the place. And now you go out and there's none. 
So it's a big problem, but we're working on how to fix that. And this year, um, back in August, I got to go to Panama and help some people down there who are working on how to help the Panamanian golden frog. I got to go down there and work with them and help them um, after COVID and the pandemic, they needed some help opening their visitor center and um, getting sort of their feet off the ground. So um, this facility is called EVAC, which stands for the El Valle Amphibian Conservation Center. El Valle is a place and they have their own conservation center. Heidi and Edgardo are the two people that run it. So this is Edgardo and this is his wife, Heidi. And their mission basically is to take in amphibian species that are struggling, breed them in their facility and re-release them. And by doing that, they're hoping to keep the amphibians in Panama going strong. And so I'll show you where we are. So Panama um, is this country that goes between North America's up here and South America's down here. And it's a really long and skinny country, but you have the Caribbean Sea up here and the Pacific Ocean down here. And El Valle is this little red dot kind of right in the middle. Um, and it's a beautiful town. There's artwork everywhere. There's so much color. They have um, really tall mountains on every, um, every side around town because the town actually used to be a crater of a volcano that erupted. And so now all the sides are just these really steep mountains and it's really beautiful. And this is me sitting on a golden frog bench, which was great. And this is what their facilities look like. So they moved into this cabin and inside it looks like this. And they have several um, sort of frog terrariums set up so that people can come and visit and learn about the frogs and donate. And then behind their facility, they have these containers where they have lots and lots of tanks with frogs in them that they're trying to breed. Um, and this room had, these are all bins with crickets and fruit flies and things to feed the frogs because the frogs have to eat just like we do. Um, this photo up here is um, baby golden frogs. So they have been able to breed them and they have a couple hundred little babies. So their work is paying off. Um, and so I was down there for about two weeks. Um, and part of the cool parts of being a biologist is that field work is really, really cool because you get to go out and see the animals that you study um, and have sort of your hands in the conservation, which is really hard to do from San Francisco. And so when we were down there, we had two weeks and we helped them do three different tasks, kind of. Um, we wanted to help them build their visitor center. So we put um, all of the tanks together so that they could put some frogs in them so that people who were visiting could see um, amphibians native to the area. And then at night times, we went out and we did surveys. So we had our headlamps on, our flashlights, and we were just looking for any type of animal that we could find. So we knew how many or what type of species were in those areas. Um, that's work that um, a lot of field biologists do is just, we call it taking inventory, but we're basically just counting and figuring out how many species and where they're found so that we know if the numbers are dropping or if numbers are increasing, things like that. And then the last thing that we did was um, there was a golden frog festival. So people came out in the streets and started dancing and having a great time and celebrating the golden frog because um, frogs are really important. And so we helped with the celebration too. So let's see, the first week that we were there, we built exhibits. So we had to find all of these parts to build some plumbing so that the water, um, we could, you know, you have to keep the water clean when you have frogs in a, in a tank. Um, so we had to find plumbing parts. We cleaned all the glass. We had to go out and find plants to put in there. Um, and this is a time lapse of us putting some of those tanks together. So this is my coworker, Tim. He and I went together and it took us about eight days to put together 
I think, nine different tanks. Um, and sometimes we would start at 7 a.m. and take a couple breaks for, for lunch and dinner, but we would work all the way up until 10 or 11 p.m. at night. So it was really long days. But then once they were all done, we got to put the animals on and they were able to open open their visitor center. So people who came to visit were able to see different different frog species, which was really cool. So cool. Uh, I think, again, uh, Ruby has a question or a comment. Ruby, go mm -hmm. ahead. So I have a question about the golden frogs. Sure. Um, how many babies can they have at one time? That's a great question. So frogs, when they lay eggs, they usually lay anywhere between like 40 and 100 at a time. It depends on the type of frog, but not all of them survive. So of all of those eggs, hopefully maybe 10% will survive. And a lot of things can go wrong, finding food, all of that stuff. Only 10%? That's a, that's a guess. It could be more in some species and less in others. But that's so sad because that means, Ruby, out of 40, you only have four left. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, like if we don't protect them, there's not too many that end, end up being, you know, like grown up frogs. Yeah. Alice, did you have something to say? I couldn't see the picture or the video because mm, it was all black. Ah, uh -oh. okay. So do you see it now? Do you see the screen now? No, it's all black. Oh, oh could, you, could you ask your mom if she's around? Maybe you need help. Um, I think, does anybody else have a question? Should we move on? Sua, did you have a question? I want to see the video again. <laughs> Here we go. We were moving so fast. Yeah. Many, many projects. We also do this here at the Academy. So all of the, the animal habitats that you see when you're walking around, all the aquariums and things like that, we are the ones that design them and put in all of the rocks and the, the plants and anything that you see in there. So it's a fun project. Anytime I need to um, build a new exhibit, you can kind of be creative and say, I want that plant to be in that corner. I want this log to cascade. I want to put a waterfall over there. Um, and then figuring out how to do all of the all of the plumbing or all of the work to do that. It's a fun challenge. It takes a little bit of math, a little bit of planning ahead of time, um, a lot of creativity. Hmm. And uh, Alice, now can you see it? Yeah, it's good. Okay. So we're going to move on to the next. I can't see it. You can't? Can you see this slide now? So Alice, if you cannot, maybe you can leave and then come back. Oh. Is it okay now? In a minute. So you can you can leave a note on the chat if you can not see it. But I recommend you leave and then come back if you, if something is um, not working. Okay. All right. So. All right. So this is just a slide. Um, showing how we got some of the supplies. So Tim and I, we went out to the river and got some rocks. Um, but if you remember, I said how the chytrid fungus travels in water. Mm -hmm. And so when we took the rocks out of the river, we had to, basically we had to clean them. And the only way to do that is to put them in the oven and bake them because chytrid fungus can't survive high temperatures. So we had to be a little bit creative how we cleaned things before we brought them into the building because we didn't want to bring in any diseases. So we baked some rocks. Um, this is me pulling some plants off the tree to take inside. Um, we only took a few plants. We didn't take very many, but that was an easy way to decorate some of the habitat. Then at nighttime, 
we went out to different places around the town and for maybe three or four hours, we would go out and count everything that we saw. Um, and surprisingly, we didn't see too much stuff. So in one night, in three hours, we would see maybe six, seven animals. Um, but these are photos of some of the things we did see. So we saw a red-eyed green tree frog. These are two different kinds of glass frogs. And glass frogs are clear on their bellies. So you can see their organs. You can see their hearts beating and stuff like that. Um, this is a baby glass frog, so it still has its tail from the tadpole stage. Um, big old yellow spider. I don't know what kind of spider that was. We saw a snake eating a lizard. That was crazy. Um, this is a whip scorpion. Um, these are some glass frog eggs, which was really great to see. It means that the frogs are reproducing. And then this one here was probably my favorite. This is an eyelash viper, which is a venomous species of snake. And that was really cool because I had never seen a venomous species of snake um, in Central America anyway. And then the last thing that we did was we helped with the Panamanian Golden Frog Festival. So one morning we did a trash pickup, um, cleaned up some of the roadways. There was a 5K run. There were people in the streets dancing and in costumes and just spreading love and cheer for Panamanian Golden Frogs, which was really great. And um, we're hoping that we can start celebrating in California too. We can start doing some golden frog things in August and spread some awareness. And um, this center that we went to work at, EVAC, they have a lot of plans for the future. So they still have to figure out how to get the frogs sort of immune to the different diseases before they reintroduce them. And they want to expand partnerships and get more funding and all of that. So that's stuff that we're hoping that we can help them with from, um, from here in San Francisco at the Academy of Sciences. So mm -hmm. we are hoping to continue uh, collaborating with them. Fancy word for being friends and being partners and helping each other out. So what are some ways that you all can help the rainforest? So you don't have to go to the rainforest to to help or to to breed frogs or build exhibits or anything like that. You can help the rainforest just from here, from home. Um, so spreading the word, telling your friends and family about how important rainforests are and just being aware that a lot of the things that we do um, every day in our society can impact the rainforest. So reduce, reuse, recycle. We want to reduce how much waste we put out into the environment. So that can be carbon dioxide, that can be trash, um, it can be plastic, it can be all sorts of things. So we want to re reduce how much um, impact we have on the environment. Um, a really easy way to do that is by reusing things that we already have. So instead of using paper towels that are made out of paper, which is made out of trees, we can use cloth towels and just pop them in the washing machine and then reuse them. So that's a lot less that we're throwing away. Um, or if there's things that we do have to throw out, we want to recycle them properly. So trash goes in the trash bin. Hard papers, hard plastics can be recycled into something different. Those go in the recycle bin. Anything organic like um, food scraps, um, soft papers, things like that can go in the compost, which is just uh, a little bin that you can have in your backyard that earthworms will turn it into soil and you can use that soil to plant plants and things like that. So very easy things that we can do to reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, choosing responsible products. So um, I'm not sure how many of you know that a lot of the bananas that we eat every day are actually shipped to America from Central America, from Costa Rica and places like that. And that means that those fruits have to be picked. They go on a boat or on trucks or on an airplane that uses a lot of fuel and um, produces carbon dioxide into the atmosphere just to get them to our country. Whereas you could go to your local farmer's market and buy fruit that is grown 
just down the street or in California, so it doesn't have to travel very far. And so buying fruits that are grown right here or local um, helps reduce impacts on other places in the world. Um, meat is also another thing that a lot of our meat comes from other places, but if you buy from the local chicken farm or you buy your eggs from Petaluma, which is just right north of where we are, there's a lot of stuff that is grown locally, so we don't have to pay for extra shipping, um, things like that. And there's also um, some labels when you're at the grocery store that I'll talk about later that will tell you that this product is grown sustainably, so you're not causing um, any other impacts. Some other things, actually the main other thing, the one that I really look for when I go to the grocery store is palm oil. That if you read through the list of ingredients on a product that you're buying and it says palm oil, um, a lot of times that's not a very good ingredient because they um, will cut down rainforest to harvest palm oil. Mm -hmm. And so if you can buy a product that has a different type of oil in it, vegetable oil or canola oil or something, that's much better for the environment than palm oil. Um, rainforest certified products, I'll talk about that in a second. And then another way is if you want to get involved, you can create a rainforest club at your school. Um, you can donate. There's a lot of places that are looking for, um, for donations and things like that. So I'm happy to share more on how you can get involved, but making little changes in your day-to-day -day life by recycling or by choosing products at the grocery store, those are really easy ways to make a small impact. And then once you're comfortable with one, you can add on another. Um, there are also a couple apps that you can use. So there's this one called the Sustainable Palm Oil app. It was created by the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. And this will tell you whether or not um, the palm oil that you're trying to use is in, uh, harvested in a sustainable way or not. Um, there's another one called the Jiki Zero app, which I actually use this one. And it would be really fun for you all if you wanted to get your parents involved a little bit. But this Jiki app, you go in and it'll ask you a series of questions on like, how do you get to school or work? Um, how much water do you use? Um, do you make your own food or do you go out to restaurants? You know, things like that. And then it'll tell you what little changes you can make to make sure that your um, lifestyle is very low impact on the environment. So it's a really fun app. It gives you some tips and tricks on how to um, reduce your um we call it carbon footprint, but basically reduce your impact on other places. And then this one on the right is the Rainforest Alliance certification. And this is a logo that you'll see at the grocery store. It's on like coffee and chocolate bars and things like that. But if you see this logo, it means that your food or um, ingredients used in that food are really good for the rainforest, for people that live in the rainforest, for the economy, all of those things. So if you see this logo, that means it's a really good product that is okay to use and it doesn't affect the rainforest in a bad way. All right, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> that was really wonderful, right guys? And I think it's now time for you guys to ask whatever questions, make whatever comments. And by the way, did you guys, can we go back? Just one slide. Sure. Have, you guys, have you guys ever seen that logo the logo on the right like uh, on a i don't know on something that you buy at a grocery store i think you if you guys haven't seen one or haven't seen it you guys probably can start looking <laughs> mm -hmm. next time your mom or dad goes grocery store shopping ask if you can go with them and see if you can find this on something yeah that's at least one little thing that you can you can follow up on from mm -hmm. the presentation that Kelsey has given you today. Yeah, I think Sua has a question or comment. So 
Is like, is this good? Is this a good thing? If it says like eco-friendly packaging? Mm-hmm. Yes. It says eco-friendly packaging. Oh, that's great. Yeah, eco-friendly packaging. That's that's also really important. So you want to know that the product that you're buying, like the food itself, is is a really good product. But you also want to know that the packaging that it's in is good. Because you could have really good ingredients or really good snacks, but it's in a plastic bag that you can't recycle and so you're just going to throw it away and create waste. So that's a really good a really good thing to look for. Yep. Very nice. Also, um is this good if it says USDA certified bio-based product? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if it's USDA approved, that's also a good thing. Okay. Well, so does anybody else have a question or comment? I want to I want to see what um let's see. Tia thought about the presentation. Um I think it was very educational and oh my god, I was wrong with my voice right now. Um and then it was also very fun and uh-huh. I like how you put in all the pictures and the videos to show us what it's like to work there and how you like take care of them and what you do and you're like life as like a biologist, biologist. Um, and it was a very nice presentation. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> what a good comment. And uh, did it, like anything specific stand out for you guys? Kate, was there something that you really enjoyed listening to or like learning about? I like learning about how we can like save it but like because like whenever i try to do something like Mm -hmm. let's say i try to recycle something by like reusing it Mm -hmm. um, i was like my mom's gonna like like she knows that recycling is good Mm -hmm. and she she, like (laughs) she appreciates it it's just the fact that like like let's say i make something out of cans right like aluminum cans and then I put it on the wall or something, and he's she's like, "That's pretty, but um, we don't really have room for it." So I'm like, uh, I don't, what do I do then? What do I recycle then?" Mm. So you guys, like something that you guys can do as the children in your family, you can talk to your parents about what you are learning right? You've learned a lot today, and I'm sure you are learning at school some things about our environment and what we need to do. Learning is one thing. If you don't actually practice it, it means nothing. Like knowing a lot of things, yes, that's cool, but so what? You need to actually take an, take action and like make a change, okay? And it's not it's not impossible for little kids like you guys to convince your parents, impress your parents, yeah? And have them work with you guys, mm-hmm. always. They'll be very happy to hear what you have to say. I, Kate, I bet your mom will totally be happy. And so, you also don't have to do everything all at once from that list, just pick one to start with. And if it's easy, and you feel comfortable having that be part of your lifestyle, then you can add something on top of it. But just doing one of those things is really helpful. Mm -hmm. And Ruby, what do you have to say? I have something to show. Oh, so it's our show time. So if you guys have done something, like have drawn something um, to show Kelsey, let's show. Oh, I see. I see that there's. <laughs> All right. So. Oh, wow. oh yeah, I, I've I've drawn that before, but I just sorry. Oh my gosh, I love it. Oh, Those are great. great. <laughs> That's really awesome, Tua. It looks great, Ara. Ara, is that a cat? Or no? What is it? I. I don't has I don't know what the name is, but actually I think it's some kind of cat. Uh-huh. 
Ah, some kind of cat that lives in the rainforest. That's really ah. nice. And Sua, I saw. It's some kind of bird that I also don't know. <laughs> that looks like a toucan to me. That's yes. what I was going to say. <laughs> yes. Honey, it's a toucan that lives in the Amazon rainforest. Yeah. Uh, and then Ruby. What is Ruby, that? Ruby, hold it a little closer. Yes. Okay, let me actually spotlight yours. <laughs> and which one is that? Uh, I just started making it. Oh, this is a leopard, by the way. Oh, awesome. I have more to this, by the way. You know, I thought this is what the um, competition was about. Mm -hmm. but the contest avatar to like help the Teochi friends out for the forest. So I'm going to add that later. But I don't really have an avatar. That's the thing. I'm uh -huh. kind of in this. And there's also a cat. Honey, what you have drawn can be your avatar. Yeah, avatar doesn't have to be a, a, a certain form, okay? Yeah, so um, Ruby loves making these posters. They say, like, we need to save the world. So, oh, yeah. But in this case? Things, uh, with you, Chelsea, later, like through email. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Yeah. In this case? It's a, it is a message. It's just that it's actually a message in song form. Oh, that's cool. All right. Uh -oh. Yeah, so Ruby, take a picture later and like upload uh, all of your creations. Oh. Nice. I see a snake there too. And there's another leopard. And then the, if you can see it, like over here, there's a cat getting chased by bees. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Very awesome. Very interesting. Yeah. And Alice, what do you what do you have to say? I have two pictures and the one is a butterfly. Oh, pretty. Wow, that's very and beautiful. This, this picture is a drawing that I drew for my dad. And Aww. this is my dad. And this is me. And this is my mom. And the rainbow is in fall. <laughs> wow, that's super interesting. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. And Kate, what do you have to say? This was like a long, long time ago that I drew this, but it's still very, very good, and I like it. But so I made a toucan on a branch, uh, holding a flower in his beak. Oh, cute! This was like a this was like a few months ago, though. Wow! How come you didn't upload that? <laughs> no, I did, but it was like. Really? I like it. Yeah, it looks great, right, guys? It's very yeah. colorful. Yeah. So I worked hard on the claws. It yeah. took so long. Hot claws part is so hard. I agree. Yeah. I did the same thing, but mm -hmm. it was hard. It took a long time. Yeah. Two so this is how many this is how many tries before I mastered <laughs> the art of this. Really good. Very cool. And um, Chuan, do, do you, did you enjoy the talk? Of course I did. Uh -huh. <laughs> did you learn? Was there anything that stood out for you? Was there anything so interesting to you? Uh, actually, everything was interesting to me. Aww. Equally. Yeah, great. Yeah. So um, Kelsey, oh my gosh, this has been really, really fun. And thank you so much. We hope to have you, you know, like with a bigger crowd sometime in the future. Yeah, I would love. Yeah. I would absolutely love that. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is great. Yeah. Thank you. And guys, can you say thank you or show your hearts before she leaves? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Talk thank to you all so soon. Much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Awesome. Bye, everybody. Bye, Thanks for Bye time. guys. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you.